industrial policy and tariffs, things to protect our manufacturing here in America, those are wonderful things, right? Well, maybe not so much. Um, we are joined today by Samuel Gregg. He is uh, an economist, a, a thinker himself who's looked into these things. And he's here to tell us that maybe there's a little more to the story than you might think. So tune in to Manufacturing Talks here with Sam Gregg in just a few moments. Welcome to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vinosky. Industry has a million cool stories, and Jim talks to the movers and shakers who are making them happen. Let's dive in. EYS Media, your digital media relations agency. Public relations, website design, digital marketing. You get found by the customers and talent who need your solutions. You get media placements and top publications, the best job candidates coming to your website, a digital presence that gets you found by the right people. Call 616-298-8798 to get started today. All right, folks, welcome to Manufacturing Talks. I'm Jim Vanosky, your host. And as always, thanks to DYS Media, our sponsor. Go check them out online. Great guys over there. And really excited today to have Samuel Gregg with us. He is a distinguished fellow of political economy at the American Institute for Economic Research, um, author of a wonderful book, uh, The Next American Economy. And, and I'm hoping it is The Next American American Economy as he spells it out. Welcome, Sam. Jim, thanks for having me on. Great to be back with you. Good to be with you. Thank you. We've got a lot to cover, lots of uh, things going on in the world to talk about. But before we do, um, why don't you just tell us about your background, how you got doing what you're doing? Oh, well, as you can probably tell from my voice, I wasn't born in the United States, yeah. but I wasn't born in Britain either. I was uh, born in Australia and I grew up in uh, Tasmania. I went to university in the University of Melbourne. I went to uh, England and did my doctorate at Oxford in the 1990s in political economy. Uh, and I moved to the United States in 2001. Uh, my interests are pretty varied, but in terms of uh, for our discussion today, it's very much in the area of uh, the relationship between what you might call economics, culture, and politics, what people like Adam Smith would have called uh, political economy. Mm -hmm. And for the past, well, I would say for the past seven years, the bulk of my time has been, both in terms of speaking as well as writing, has been very much focused on the topic material that we're going to be talking about today. It's contained in my book, The Next American Economy, because as you know, there's a very intense debate now uh, across the political spectrum. This is not a right-left thing anymore. This is a, you find people on the left who disagree about some of the subjects we're going to be talking about today. There are also people on the right who disagree about some of the subjects we're going to be talking about today, uh, because it seems to me that we do have now a choice in America between what you might call essentially a, a free economy, free market economy that's mm -hmm. dynamic and open to the world and competitive and entrepreneurial. And the alternative to that is what I call state capitalism, which is it's not it's not socialism. It's not a command economy. Yeah. It's much more an economy in which the state takes on um, some fairly hefty responsibilities in trying to deliver particular economic, cultural, social, and political outcomes. And uh, anyone who's read my book knows I'm very skeptical about the second group. Yeah. But I tried in the book to try. I try to give them a, a fair presentation of their ideas, and then explain why I think they're mistaken, and why I think a free market approach is a much more real and vibrant and promising future for America. Right. Yeah. And, and what you mentioned as far as that kind of intense debate, I'll admit it's even been in my own head as we've seen some of the mm -hmm. kind of depredations from China. Um, right. That there might need to be more activity and we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. But one thing I wanted to hit on real quickly in your book, you make it really clear that like you just said, you, you, you're you very skeptical of government and, and what it can accomplish. But there are more and more people who feel like government has to have that hand in guiding wealth creation. So tell us more just about that broad topic, your thoughts on that. 
Well, as you know, there's been a pretty big shift across the political spectrum, I want to stress that again, towards uh, a more positive view of the government intervening in the economy, whether it's trade via things like tariffs or industrial policy and trying to shape particular outcomes in particular sectors of the economy, particularly manufacturing, right? Yeah. Um, which you know all about. And um, this, I think, is very much a, um, a shift that's happened for a number of reasons. One, I think, is um, that America has gone through a lot of different problems over the past 20 years. I often like to say to people, we're not living in the 1980s anymore. Um, that's when I grew up as a, as a child at that point in history and the world seemed to be going in the direction of free markets and free enterprises at the period of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, etc. But really, I'd say since the early 2000s, we had a pretty significant recession at that point. We had the financial crisis. Yeah. We've had 9-11. We had the Great Recession. We've had Obamacare. Uh, we've had COVID. We've had massive intervention into the economy by the federal government, as well as by the Federal Reserve. We've had quantitative easing. So in that light, it's not surprising, I think, that a lot of people are saying, well, maybe we do need to have more government involved in the economy. And they're proposing particular policies for giving uh, concrete effect to that idea. Uh, and I understand where that's coming from. I'm not one of these people who's dismissive and saying, look, there's nothing to worry about. America's in great shape. No, America has some serious cultural, social, and economic problems. But I also think that the proposals that are coming in terms of more government intervention, wherever that's to be found, I think are deeply mistaken and would only make the situation worse. But that, of course, means that those of us who believe in free trade, free markets, dynamic competition and entrepreneurship, we need to up our game in terms of presenting the positive case for these things. It's very easy to critique protectionists and industrial policy people because the problems with their proposed solutions, I think, are, are pretty clear and, and are very hard to deny. Yeah. But those of us who believe in free markets, we've got to do a much better job at presenting the case for markets. Because I often say, those of us who are free marketers, we're really good at policy. Mm -hmm. What we're not so good at is presenting the wider, deeper, let's call it normative case for why we should have economic freedom. And that's where the book tries to sort of show how we can achieve that. Yeah, and, and does a wonderful job, I would add. I, I personally benefited hugely from reading it, it helped clarify my, clarify my thinking. And, you know, you mentioned my my world of manufacturing, mm -hmm. and you delve quite a bit into that and talk about things like protectionism and, like you said, industrial policy and make the case against that. So dive a little more into those topics and why you think they're kind of misguided. Well, as you know, of course, manufacturing and the state of manufacturing in the United States is in a lot of people's minds. Yeah. It's a political football, obviously, we know that both on the left and the right talk a great deal about this when they talk about um, the economy. Manufacturing is what a lot of people seem to be focusing upon. And there's no doubt that manufacturing has changed a great deal since the late mm -hmm. 1970s. I think it was 1979 when manufacturing employment reached its peak in the United States. Yeah. And then it's since gone down. And that's, of course, what a lot of people focus upon. And they ask questions, well, what happened to all that, all those people? What's happened to them? And they will often go to places like Youngstown, Ohio, and say, look, this is what happens when manufacturing gets emptied out, etc." And I don't deny that, of course, there have been these significant changes in the manuf American manufacturing over the past, well, almost 40 years now, right. in fact, more than 40 years. But I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, America remains um, at the top or near the top of most of the world's manufacturing categories, that most of the change that's happened in manufacturing in terms of employment is primarily to do with technology, not so much outsourcing, right. not so much jobs going to China. It's overwhelmingly a case of 
technology. And I think all the evidence very much points in that type of direction. American manufacturing, as you know, has moved very much in this high-tech, um, sophisticated manufacturing direction, which is where our, America's comparative advantage is. It makes no sense for us to be producing 1950s uh, cars with 1950s technology. Uh, um, we just do things a lot better with uh, sophisticated high-tech. That's our comparative advantage. would be silly not to pursue that. But that, of course, means changes in the mm -hmm. employment makeup of those people who walk in work in manufacturing. One of the um, images I use in the book is that if you go into a manufacturing plant today, you're much more likely to see men and women walking around mm -hmm. wearing lab coats and lots of robots and sophisticated technology. And that's a very different world from, say, Detroit factories in the 1950s pumping out cars. Right. So, uh, but of course, the response of many people when they see these changes in manufacturing is that they, they say things like, well, manufacturing's in decline, et cetera. And I say, well, actually, that's not really true. Right. If you mean decline in numbers employed, yes, but a lot of those people now work in the service sector. And mm -hmm. that's great because in many cases, they're earning higher wages there. And that's where the jobs are. But of course, there's lots of people who want to use tariffs and industrial policy to... I, I think they're sort of trying to recreate a type of world that existed in the 1950s, 1960s mm -hmm. that doesn't exist anymore uh, and in which you need very different skills from people that were needed in the 1950s and 1960s. And my argument is that tariffs don't actually help these transitions. In fact, I think they make them worse. They raise costs for importers of goods that a lot of Ameri American manufacturers use. Um, they discourage, tar tariffs discourage us from being adaptable and flexible and resilient and competitive. And that's a very, when you lose that, that's a really big problem. Uh, and as, as for industrial policy, industrial policy is immensely costly and it delivers lousy results for the most part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So while I'm certainly very sympathetic and I try and, you know, give voice to those who have been affected by changes in manufacturing over the past 40 years, not always for the better, my argument is that tariffs and protectionism do not do and do not fulfill the promise that they say they fill. So that's uh, the first thing. And that secondly, they create political problems in the form of cronyism and favoritism, which is very damaging in the long term for both politics and, and business. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and thirdly, if we're going to have this strong manufacturing base in America, then we need to remain open and dynamic and competitive. And industrial policy and protectionism take you in the exactly opposite direction. So I'm going to play devil's advocate in a couple of oh. regards now. Um, you mentioned the 70s when gross manufacturing uh, labor numbers maxed out. Mm -hmm. Another thing that happened in the 70s, obviously, is we started with the promulgation of regulations to protect yeah. the environment, to pr protect people's safety, right. which are phenomenal things. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we talk in the manufacturing world that we really also, like you said about people um, favoring free markets need to do a bit of marketing. We in manufacturing need to do the same because our jobs aren't unsafe and dirty and dismal right. anymore. But at the same time, obviously that has implications as far as us competing on a fair playing field with, you know, the China's of the world, other right. countries that don't have those protections. What do you say to people who say, well, some tariffs should be instituted just to level that playing field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a very common argument that you, I'm sure you've encountered and I've encountered in, in many different settings. And my response is always to say, look, um, tariffs hurt the people who are implementing them as much as the people that they are targeted against. Mm -hmm. A very good example of this was the, um, the Trump administration uh, and steel tariffs in the 19, in what, well, the in the uh, late 2010s. And as you know, the Trump administration put tariffs on steel and it's estimated that they saved about 6,000 jobs, but downstream they cost 60,000 jobs. Right. So that's a very good example. I use other examples of the book of 
how getting into the trade war game, even with a country like China, which, and I know, know as you know from reading the book, I'm no apologist for China. Right. China is a Marxist, autocratic, authoritarian regime that's engaged in serious, um, serious, uh, 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 seriously problematic economic policies that that hurt itself as much as it, right. it seems to hurt us as well. But but the, my point is that tariffs are not the way that you respond to obvious challenges like China because they're very ineffective. They don't really realize the goal that they are intended to realize. They get captured by special interests, as it happens again and again and again and again. Um, and they only cause us to inflict a great deal of inefficiency and misallocation of resources on our own part. So what is very tempting to say, well, we're hitting back against the Chinese and so this is this is good. Yeah. Well, maybe, but we're also hurting ourselves. So I think tariffs is a very ineffective way of trying to deal with what I acknowledge are real are real challenges coming out of places like China. Who's you say don't abide by the same environmental regulations, etc. Yeah. Uh, but in the long term, I think that's going to cause them some significant um, problems because at some point, they're going to have to add those things into the economic mix of how they go about doing manufacturing. Yeah. Pressures will come for that. And at that point, that's when they're going to start having to add a lot of costs to their own processes, which we or we already have, have crossed that Rubicon. Yeah, interesting. Um, and and it, I agree, the, the whole China picture is, <clears throat> is just muddied. People don't realize yes. that a lot of their actions have hurt that country itself. And like the Belt and Road Initiative certainly is not paying off by all uh, indications. And yet, you know, that was an industrial policy itself, right? We can say that it's failed, but we play devil's advocate again. Here's another wonderful book called Freedom's Forge about mm -hmm. uh, World War II and how uh, American industry stepped in and really help deliver that knockout blow to the Axis powers. Isn't that a success of industrial policy that we could replicate today? Well, the difference between then and now is that we're not engaged in a world war against uh, three totalitarian great powers. Uh, we're not. As far as I can tell, we're not. We live in a very, very different geopolitical setting. China is obviously a geopolitical rival to the United States, <clears throat> uh, but we're not at war with it. Uh, and I'm very glad that that's the case. But we also know that when in wartime, you are willing to do things that have a type of a very narrow target and a very specific aim, and you're, you're willing to orientate the whole economy about achieving that. In the case of World War II, that was defeating Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Imperial Japan. And that, that was an existential struggle. There's no question about that. Very different visions of civilization were at stake. But that was also for only basically a four-year period on the part of the United States. And when the war ended, we didn't keep producing tanks. We didn't keep producing lots and lots of planes. Of course, we moved into the Cold War, so there was still a great deal of military spending. But we weren't engaged in this type of immediate threat to the United States. So I think the analogy between then and now fails. And the other thing to think about is that if America had had continued with that model after the Second World War, it would literally have made no sense because right. there was no one there was no one power we were engaged in a war against. We weren't aiming to defeat that power within a certain period of time, et cetera, et cetera. We were moving into a very different situation. Now, I agree when Adam Smith says that defense trumps opulence, right? So national security certainly does trump um, uh, economic policy, right. right? There's no question about that. And free traders have always acknowledged that point. But the national security situation that we face in the world today is not that of World War II. So the notion of gearing up the entire nation in the way that uh, was done during the Second World War, 
makes no economic sense and doesn't make geopolitical sense either. Right. Yeah. I'm going to jump on your side now and say two other things about, and it was an amazing story. That's a great book. You, sh you should read that if you haven't. Mm -hmm. um, the gentleman that Roosevelt and the administration reached out to and, and kind of put in charge were not government men, right? They were right. industrial leaders, some of whom had come up from the industrial floor working right with the equipment. And I'm just amazed because they, they didn't go out and just dictate to people here, you're going to make this, you're going to make that. They created a market. They had the defense contractors competitively bidding on, you know, what's the best plane, what's the best tank. And then when that was selected, they went out to suppliers and said, okay, give us your bids and awarded contracts. Not always cleanly. It's like still a government right. operation. Right. But, but that to me is one distinction is they did create that market. The other is, and you, you mentioned it at the end of the war, we weren't making, tanks and, and planes anymore. In fact, what we were doing was mulching the ones we had. You go look at the pictures of the fields in what was it, Arizona or New Mexico where they had the, the airplane graveyards, you yes. know, acres and acres of B-17s and P-51s that were just shredded for recycle. Think of the wealth right. of destruction that World War II represented. Right. Right. So, yes. Right. So no, that's so the I understand a lot of people make that analogy between mm -hmm. then and now. It's not an uncommon thing for people to do because yeah. at a surface level it sort of makes sense, but when you dig down into the details, you realize that's war. <laughs> that's a very different situation to the right. world that we're in now. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too is you think about you know the the car makers weren't making cars; they were making right. military vehicles and tanks and. In right. planes, you know, will it run? Right. Um, Which can't be used so people by didn't get cars. Yeah. Right. So, the, yeah, you, you mentioned a very different situation. People were willing, were willing to sacrifice their own comfort to win the war. Not necessarily going to be the case today. Um, I want to share yes. this again. Mm -hmm. I'm in Michigan, and, and it's huge news here that the uh, Whitmer administration and Ford have teamed up on this ginormous battery plant that they're, you know, partnering up with our hmm. adversaries, the Chinese to build and giving them over a billion dollars to build it. And, uh, you know, uh, you can kind of get from my tone how I feel about it. But talk about that kind of thing, where government bestows these enormous subsidies on industries. Isn't that a great thing? We're going to build all these car batteries for this glor um, glorious electrified future that, that they're promising us? Well, again, this is a classic example of industrial policy, this time in the form of government business partnership with a fair amount of government economic support, whether it's tax breaks or subsidies or whatever it happens to be. Uh, now, if you put enough money and resources into a given industrial policy, you will get some results. There's no question about that. But that's at the cost of a lot of other opportunities that go by the wayside and other potentially better and more efficient allocations of capital and resources that you will never know about mm -hmm. because you've chosen this particular path. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, industrial policy like this relies on somehow government planners at some level thinking that they can outguess the market when it comes to the efficient allocation of resources. And we know the government planners are very, very bad at that. Uh, the third thing is I think that this will create, an, will exacerbate an existing problem, which of course is crony relationships between our manufacturers and state yeah. government. That's, this is not a new thing, but it's also still a bad thing. Uh, I think also that when you look at the track record of industrial policy, whether it's things like the example you're using or remember Solyndra during oh, yeah. the Obama administration yeah. uh, or Foxconn, mm -hmm. Foxconn in Michigan, just across the lake from Michigan. Um, or if you think about industrial policy in Japan, which was extensively used in uh, different parts of the Japanese economy or industrial policy that's being used in China today or Europe today. The track record is terrible. 
it's terrible, not just in terms of misallocation of resources, et cetera, but the results achieved um, are just not particularly good. And while often there's a, there's often a great initial burst of energy, which happens when you've got a, suddenly got a lot of resources going into one particular area, uh, that's very difficult to sustain over time. So, uh, I mean, I say good luck. I hope it works. But I think given the track record of industrial policy, uh, I think one can be reasonably sceptical that this industrial policy, like any other industrial policy, will yield the results that it promises. And if it does yield results, it will come with a lot of other pieces of baggage that will all likelihood cancel out by a big margin any potential positive developments that might come out of this. Yeah. Interestingly enough, there's a 2014 article on Michigan Capital Confidential about another Michigan governor, our current energy secretary, Jennifer Brown. Uh -huh. Yes, And her partnership with the Obama administration to pump over a billion dollars into Michigan for what? Battery plants. <laughs> and it's just amazing how we don't learn from our mistakes. Uh, in that regard, talk more about Japan, because to me, that's mm. a story everyone should know about and we should be right. learning from. So, um, in the, as I mentioned before, I was a child in the 1980s. And uh, like you, I can remember being told Japan was the future. Yeah. Um, the Japanese were buying up everything. Our movies were full of um, uh, <laughs> things like Black Rain, yeah. uh, Die Hard, remember, the Nakatomi <laughs> Tower and all this. It was all, all indicating that the Japanese economic model, which had a fair amount of industrial policy built into it, was the future. And there were books written at the time. Mm -hmm. by people, some people who are writing today about industrial policy, arguing that America needed to be more like Japan. We needed lots of industrial policy, and we need to, to basically mimic Japan's super ministry, which was primarily focused upon delivering industrial policy, mm -hmm. which I might add no longer exists. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, and And... As we went into the 80s, there were lots of people arguing for this, and legislators and um, uh, public intellectuals and some economists were writing in favor of these things. And, and just as everyone was urging America to go down this path of using industrial policy throughout the country in the way, a similar way that Japan had, Japan entered a 20-year period of economic stagnation. And in the early 2000s, the Japanese finance ministry put out a report on what had happened to the Japanese economy. And uh, it wasn't read by that many people. But the lesson was very clear. In fact, it basically says the Japanese model in industrial policy was not the cause of our success. It was the cause of our failure. And that was a pretty big admission. <clears throat> now, it seems to have been lost on people in America who are, indu are advocating industrial policy today. But everywhere you looked in the Japanese economy, those parts of the Japanese economy that were prosperous, that had been profitable as, as exporters, et cetera, were precisely the ones that had very little to no industrial policy. Those segments of the Japanese economy that had a lot of industrial policy were precisely the ones that were stagnating. And it makes sense, right? Because yep. industrial policy means foregoing the disciplines of competition. It means getting lazy. It means not taking economic entrepreneurship seriously. Instead, entrepreneurship becomes about how do I secure favors and privileges from the government? And people can be really good and entrepreneurial at doing that. Yep. But the long-term cost is economic efficiency, collapsing dynamism, uh, perversion of entrepreneurship, growing cronyism, unhealthy relationships and dependency between business and legislators. And that's what happened to the Japanese economy. And the same has happened to plenty of examples of industrial policy in European countries as well. Uh, and so the notion that we would go down this path, given the miserable track record of industrial policy, is something I find incredible. But as you know, it's a very attractive and live option for a lot of people yeah. today. Yeah. I love what you said about sectors of the Japanese uh, 
economy that didn't buy into that and, and mm -hmm. made their way. I mean, Japanese automakers being, to me, the perfect example of that. Oh, of course, of course. And in fact, <clears throat> we know this is this is a pattern from our own history as well. So mm -hmm. if yeah. you go back to the second half of the 19th century, we had a lot of protectionism in the United States. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about that is that those sectors of the American economy that were the most productive, the most dynamic, that drove industry were precisely the ones that were more or less not protected by yeah. tariffs. Yeah. So that's the lesson. Yeah. That we someday might learn. <laughs> well, I often say to people, it's, you know, the whole free trade argument, I think <clears throat> we made a mistake in the 1990s of wrapping that up with a sort of perpetual peace, free mm -hmm. trade will lead to sort of harmonious world, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But, um, and my argument is, well, obviously, in the case of China, that wasn't the case. China's yeah. become more authoritarian, et cetera, et cetera. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. But um, I think we need to be framing the case for free trade as how it benefits America and Americans, because I don't think we understand that. I think we tend to think of free trade as, well, this is how other people in the world get out of poverty. And, and that's all true. Mm -hmm. That's all true. But if we're trying to sell this, and explain this to Americans when the other side are really doing a pretty good job at selling some bad ideas to the American people on this subject, we have to get much better at explaining to American legislators and American citizens that this is good for us. It's good for us as consumers. It's good for us, for those of us who have businesses. It's good for us as uh, an economy. And if we have a great, dynamic, open competitive economy that makes this country stronger. In other words, we need to take the patriotism label from the protectionists mm -hmm. and adopt it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, and I loved your point about uh, China and, and how we had this big sales job that, you know, allowing them into the, uh, what was it? The, the, um, WTO. Yeah, WTO and, and favored trading status that that would, open them up and they'd be another market economy and didn't fail. You mentioned that in your book, um, a, a very good lesson to learn. Another one you touched on, and, and I want you just to real quickly expand on it, is opportunity cost, because I think we're so uh -huh. uniquely bad at analyzing that. Yeah, so opportunity cost is not a it's not a particularly new idea. It's a, it's a basic economic concept, right? And it basically says that whenever you invest money or whenever you, in, you invest capital, there's you give up the opportunity to invest in other areas, right? So with opportunity costs, with something like tariffs or industrial policy, that represents a choice to invest or try and reshape the allocation of capital. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is that government plans can outguess the market in terms of the most efficient allocation of capital. And we know that's generally not true, right? Yeah. So industrial policy means that you consciously give up, you forego potential and, and in many cases unknown opportunities that in the long term will produce more economic growth than a given industrial policy. So it's sort of like you're, you're, you're opting for a very suboptimal known, that's the industrial policy, and, but you're giving up lots and lots of unknown, but what we have a fair amount of confidence in of being very good, much more productive forms of investing capital, labor, et cetera. So that's what it means. And industrial policy is premised on the idea that the government can somehow outguess the market when it comes to these things. And we know the government is just not very good at doing that. So Industrial policy comes with huge opportunity costs. And, of course, that's in the medium term and the long term. The advantage the industrial people, policy people have is that they can point to some immediate short-term effects. Uh, and that, of course, is where a lot of people's attention span is, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But opportunity costs in the long term are given up when you embrace these types of government intervention. And that's something we just simply need to do a lot better job in educating people on. Yeah.
Well, well said. Um, we're just about out of time. Is there anything mm -hmm. we haven't covered that's kind of top of mind with you that folks ought to know about this whole subject? The, fifth, the, the last thing I'll say is that uh, this is not America's first rodeo when it comes to this, right? Because if you go back to the 19th century, after slavery, the, the biggest country, that, the subject that divided you know, Americans was tariffs. People forget that. And <clears throat> so in some respects, what we're experiencing now in America is a return to some of the old debates that we used to have, really from the founding onwards. As you know, Americans disagreed about this, some of these subjects right from the very beginning. And <clears throat> it seems to me that we can go back and learn a great deal from that history. I just mentioned, for example, that we now know that tariffs actually did not help the American economies rise to greatness in the 19th century. If anything, it probably impeded it. If we look at the history of protectionist policies and the Great Depression, remember the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act and all that, we know how disastrous these policies turned out to be. So <clears throat> in addition to good economics, which I think is crucial for discussing these debates, I think historical perspective is always important because I think what we learn from the historical perspective is that free trade, open, dynamic, competitive markets in entrepreneurship, economic entrepreneurship, deliver long-term economic growth for American consumers and American businesses and the country as a whole. So we need good economics. Good history can also help us to win these debates. Wonderful. Uh, where do people find more of your work? Well, I'd suggest they uh, go to the website of my employer, the American Institute for Economic Research. You'll find lots of materials there that I've written, as well as many of my colleagues, whether it's an economic policy, monetary policy, general issues of economic freedom. Uh, and I'd also suggest going to Amazon, typing in my name, and you'll find lots of books of mine that come up, including The Next American Economy. Yeah, I've got another one of yours on my bookshelf waiting to be read. So I'll be diving into that soon. And yeah, the AIER, um, definitely a go-to for me. I highly recommend folks going there. Sam, thank you so much. This was incredibly enlightening. Wonderful. Thank you for having me on. It's great to be with you again. Yep. And of course, thanks to all of you out in the audience for tuning in and checking this thing out. Um, we're here every Tuesday. I can't promise Every show is going to be as enlightening as what Sam brought us today, but they'll, they'll all be a, a little enlightening anyway. Thanks again. Thanks for tuning in to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vanosky. Watch for new episodes dropping every Tuesday. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe.